from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's three minutes past eight. You're listening to LBC. This is Cross Question, LBC's weekly political debate show. With me in the studio to take your questions are uh, Andrew McDougall, former advisor to Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, political consultant, Julie Bindle, feminist writer and author, good friend of the station, um, unlike Vice News, and uh, Tracy Crouch is the Conservative MP for Chatham and Aylesford and the former sports minister, of course, and Mary Cray is Labour MP for for Wakefield. You can watch us live on the LBC Facebook page on our website at lbc.co.uk or our Twitter feed at LBC and who wouldn't want to? Call 0345 60 60 973 Tweet at LBC Text 84850 Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC so lots to talk about tonight. Uh, the lines are open at 0345 973 I don't want to lead you in any way as to the questions that you might ask, but obviously Hong Kong's been in the news, the Tory leadership, uh, the campaign by Cliff Richard and Paul Gambaccini to introduce anonymity for people char- people uh, accused of sexual offences before charge, and what's going on in the EU. So lots more besides. Let's go to the first question. Ryan is in Copenhagen. Hello, Ryan. What would you like to ask? Yeah, good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Um, my question is, were the Brexit Party right in turning their backs on the EU Parliament yesterday? Well, let's bring in the Liberal Democrat protest into that as well with uh, um, the word that I can't say that <laughs> rhymes with Grolux to Brexit um, <laughs> uh, on their T-shirts. Um, they're, they're obviously different kinds of protests, but there is a, there is a, a thread there. Um, Mary Cray, let's go to you first. No, how dare they? Um, Beethoven's... Um, symphony is uh, and the ode to joy which is all men are brothers i i walked into my wedding on that i think it's a fantastic piece of music and a it sort of you know demonstrates a level of cultural ignorance uh, to just not respect a, a great piece of music it shows a disrespect for the institution which whether they like it or not they have been elected to and and i just thought you know that the comparisons that were made then with 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 uh, parties in the 1930s germany i thought were quite interesting now what as far as the t-shirts go i also think that they're problematic as well. I've got a T-shirt which says this is what a feminist looks like, but I don't wear it to Parliament because it's a bit sort of distracting and, frankly, I don't want people looking at my chest. Um, so... <laughs> So I trick confessions and trick confessions. Eyes yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, darling. But but so I, I just think it's about having respect for the institution and I think it made us look bad. Um it's another sort of cultural moment that goes around the world. And I don't think that wearing t-shirts that say men's anat- anatomical parts on is fine on a protest march. I don't think it's fine for a, a legislating body, which is what the parliament is. Julie Bindle. Well, I have far more problem with um, the fact that the Lib Dems formed a coalition with the Tories that got us into the mess that we're in now that has led to Brexit than the T-shirt, although, yeah, bad taste and childish and all the rest of it. But I saw the comments from the um, from the president who said that when a national anthem plays, you should stand. Well, yes, there are exceptions I would make to that in fascist regimes, for example. I've seen people in their own countries refuse to stand. Turning your back on uh, the anthem when they'd actually gone to the trouble of getting an opera singer Mm -hmm. and an orchestra to welcome in new MEPs is simply bad manners. That's rude. And it's 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 utterly childish and reprehensible. Um, I don't go along with with the notion that every single um, moment such as a national anthem should be respected and adhered to as though we're kind of you know, um, cap, cap doffing um, idiots. But I do think on this occasion it was inappropriate and childish. Of course, the EU isn't a country, so it, it can't really have a national anthem. It's an anthem, no. true, but but it's an anthem, and it's an anthem that 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 represents something that is great and something that people have no idea what they are giving up on in the main. Mm. Andrew McDougall. Well, I think, look, we're talking about it, right? So, you know, achievement unlocked for them. You know, they understand the way that messaging and politics works now is you have to make a statement. It has to be short. 
snappy, uh, translated in a picture. They did all that. You know, if you wanted to impress me with your principal, why don't you refuse, refuse the paycheck uh, while you're there? <laughs> you know, if you really wanted to make a principal point about your opposition to the institution called the European Union, don't take their money. I agree. Um, and, and they didn't do that. Um, but, but they won because we're talking about it. And I think they're both childish. I think they're both disrespectful. You know, I was brought up to always respect uh, the institution you're in, even if you're trying to change it, even if you don't like it act like an adult and I think we have enough childishness in politics now I think we have enough unseriousness in politics now that the last thing we need is the party the liberal democrats that are supposed to be serious about Europe acting like children on Europe because that's not going to make the positive case and the thing the EU has never quite done over the last four or five years of tumult is make the positive case for Europe in in, in a mature uh, responsible way and that's parties here in Britain and that's and that's the parties of Europe trying to convince Brits that this is still worth staying in um, Tracy Crouch, what did you make of the fact that Anne Widdicombe joined in this, which I have to say I was slightly surprised by. I would have thought she wouldn't have been so rude as to do that. And it's the sort of thing that if I'd been there and I'd done that, my mother would have wanted to slap my bottom. <laughs> well, you and I know Anne incredibly well. And like you, I think I was quite surprised. I mean, I agree with everything that everybody said. I thought it was child childish. I thought it was rude. I thought it was disrespectful. Completely agree with Andrew about the sort of kind of the, the check, you know, picking up all the pay they get paid extremely well um to be members of the european parliament and actually at the moment it will be i think counterproductive you know we're going to have a new leader of the uh, the the conservative party we're going to have a new prime minister soon who wants to go into uh europe and have discussions about renegotiation and you know i i just don't see how it's going to achieve anything by effectively um uh, behaving like they did um, let's go back to Ryan. Um, what did you think of it, Ryan? Hello. Uh, yes, I listened to the, I actually listened to the panel, and but what no one picked up on was that they're there to represent Britain. Um, Anne Whitcomb said yesterday that she's there to represent 17.4 million. She's not. She's there to represent the whole of the UK. So for me, it was it was totally disrespectful. Um, if we are going to get a good deal or try to get a reasonable deal. Why, why would the EU do anything help help us in any way if we've got MEPs acting completely and utterly childish? That, that, that is exactly how I see it. OK. Um, Ryan, thank you very much for that. Um, now, given that you all agree on this, we're not really going to have much of an argument on it, are we? Um, so, should we move on to a different question? Let's go to Stuart, who's in Barrow in Furness. Hello, Stuart. Hello. Hi, what would you like to ask? Uh, yeah, my question for the panel... Um, what are their thoughts on the proposal to uh, afford anonymity to the suspects in sexual assault and rape cases up to the point of charge? Well, this, of course, um, the, a new campaign has been launched for a parliamentary debate <coughs> on this. Um, a petition has been launched by uh, Cliff Richard, Paul Gambaccini and several other people um, outside Parliament earlier this week. Uh, Julie Bendel. Well, this isn't actually a new campaign, quite frankly. I mean, yes, it's a call for at the moment for the current government to launch an investigation or an inquiry or whatever. But this has been going on for as long as I've been a feminist campaigner, which is 40 years. Um, women were... Well, anyone who um, alleges complains of sexual assault, men, women, children, whoever, have been afforded anonymity um, <clears throat> since the 1980s because there was... There have been terrible cases, one of which was, of course, um, the so-called vicarage rape, um, which was uh, Jill Saywood, where her um, attackers ended up getting longer in prison for breaking into the vicarage um, than they did um, raping and sodomising uh, Jill Saywood. Um, and where, of course, newspapers pretty much identified her. Um, the Sun newspaper had a photograph of her. No one was left in any doubt who it was. And... The reason that that was done, and this is completely relevant to the discussion about whether or not those accused should be given anonymity, the reason why we had that was that rape is stigmatised, but the stigma is on those that complain of rape and sexual assault. Now, the vast, vast majority of rapes that are reported never go anywhere, but every single bit of credible research has shown that a tiny proportion, up to 4% maximum, may be false or inaccurate allegations of rape. This campaign, this long, long, boring, quite frankly, campaign to give those accused um, anonymity gives yet another kick 
um, or shot in the arm to those that say that women make it up all the time, that the majority of allegations are false or malicious, and that the majority of men who are convicted or even accused um, are falsely accused. Now, if we have an open criminal justice system, which we do, we have to rep we have to recognise that there are other crimes that you can be accused of, such as theft from your employer, such as beating your child to death. Um, elder abuse and murder that are also damaging to reputations but we don't call for anonymity for them and yet rape is the most underreported and under convicted crime but, on the planet so why are not, we focusing on those accused I, I think probably because i think to be accused of sexual abuse particularly of children i can't think of anything worse than being accused of something like that but if you are innocent I, i'd rather be accused of murder than that frankly well, uh, and I think that that's why. And if you've been through the trauma that Cliff Richard, Harvey Proctor, um, Simon War, I mean, there's a whole list of them. Now. And of course, they're all in the public eye. We don't know about the people not in the public eye. If you've been through that and your life has been ruined, of course, you're going to feel strongly about uh, it. Absolutely. you would, And I would if I were falsely accused of a crime, uh, particularly uh, in my instance. A sex crime because I campaign for the rights uh, of, of victims of sexual crime. But there is absolutely no doubt that if we look at high profile cases, and remember, actually, lives aren't ruined necessarily. We have we have a number of, of, of celebrities on the football pitch and elsewhere that have been accused of rape where the, 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 the case didn't ever go anywhere. And actually, they do fine. But lives are ruined where there's no justice. And that's usually on the complainants. Now, in cases such as Savile, and cases going as far back as I can remember. War Boys, for example, the, the London mm. cabbie. Those women would not have come forward were it not for an appeal. And for that, you have to name the person that has been accused. Now, I think that we should take every single bit of care with the investigation and certainly the decision to charge than we do with any serious crime. But at the moment, we have a Crown Prosecution Service that is taking even fewer cases to court because they've decided a jury will look and just decide she's been drinking, she's a bit of a slag, or he's wearing a suit and why would he need to rape? All of these prevailing rape myths, this is the problem. And with the, the conviction rate under 6% in the UK, Unless 94% of women, or anyone in fact, but mainly women, who make a complaint are lying, then we're talking about a lot of okay. rapists walking free. I'm going to come to the three of you uh, after our break. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC. This summer, Uber is sponsoring the 2019 ICC Cricket World Cup. To celebrate and say thank you, we're giving partner drivers across the UK the chance to win tickets to a match and a range of exclusive cricket goodies. To win, all you have to do is test your knowledge with a super simple cricket quiz. So if you drive with Uber, open your app now to enter, and you could be enjoying a match in the sun soon. T's and C's apply. Some not guaranteed. From director Ron Howard. Pavarotti became the global rock star. Discover the definitive story of the man behind the voice. Those songs. Can you ensure you'll hit the note? No. That is the beauty of my profession. It's magnificent. A beautiful tribute. Pavarotti. Book now for a one night only preview with QA and remastered three tenors aria in cinemas July 13th. Right now, you can choose tech worth up to £179 when you get BT Superfast Fiber. Play those summer tunes on a new Amazon Echo. Keep them to yourself with a pair of JBL 650 noise cancelling headphones. Or get out and about with a Fitbit Charge 3. From £31.99 a month on an 18-month contract with a £29.99 setup fee. This offer ends the 11th of July. Search BT Broadband. BT. Be there. New customers CPI increase each March starting 2020. 91% UK coverage. 44.49 for month 19. Pay direct debit. Terms apply. Don't miss out on Vodafone's double data deal. That's double data on all pay monthly smartphones. Yes, all pay monthly smartphones. Now a huge 30 gig for the price of 15, starting at only £30 a month. Double the selfie sharing, double the playlist pumping and double the maps mapping. To get double data, go online or in-store today. Hurry, offer ends 9th of July. The future's exciting. Ready, Vodafone. Terms and details at vodafone.co.uk slash summer. Hey, you've been out there for a while. Come on, top up your sun cream. Because I'm powering up. 
What do you mean? You can get electricity from the sun, right? So I thought I'd try it too. I don't think it quite works like that, love. But either way, you need more cream on. Fine. At Shell Energy, we supply all our home energy customers with 100% renewable electricity as standard. Just their homes, mind you. Search Shell Energy. Home energy matters. Visit shellenergy.co.uk. Being born in the USA and marrying a Galway girl may not necessarily make you walk 500 miles to a Norwegian wood like an Egyptian to bless the rains down in Africa. But if we are as open-minded, open to the world, open to new ideas as we are to music, we can all dance as part of something far, far bigger. Because we are not an island. HSBC UK. Together we thrive. And this is the end of the ad as we know it. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 18 minutes past eight here on LBC. The lines are open for your questions to our panel, 0345 6060 973. Tracy Crouch would love to have a question on sin taxes because she thinks it'll annoy me. Or women's sport. Or Football. women's sport. No, you actually. Are, no, I'm you right. hate Messes. women's sport. Man, that was so gutting. Actually, I've been a little bit converted during the World Cup. Quite right, so too. Only a little bit, though. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's go back to um, the question of anonymity uh, for people who are, who are suspected of committing sexual offences. Uh, Julie Bindle laid out her stall. Uh, let's go to Andrew McDougall, see what he thinks. Yeah, like I, I had my head turned by what Julie said too, but the first thing that came to my mind is in the internet age, how would you enforce any regime that you come up with? You know, we're, we live in this kind of Wild West information age anyway, whether you <coughs> wanted a name to get into circulation or not, I think it will find its way out there whether a media organization is then allowed to pick it up or whether a court can shut down what's online i don't think you could ever kind of solve that question but but i think you know i share your fear and I, I can't think of anything worse than being named uh, uh for something i didn't do that that that's that serious but when you hear what julie said I find that hard to disagree but with. But of course you look at cases like Rolf Harris and Stuart Hall where they were named and they were guilty and lots of people did come forward who uh, had been abused by them. So, uh, I mean, it, it is... I was slightly playing devil's advocate there, although I do think there is a case... I, you just have to put yourself in the in their position, do you not, Tracy Crouch? Well, I thought that I was sympathetic to the campaign until I heard what Julie said. And actually... Um, I completely agree. I think anything that sort of kind of enables, first of all, the protection of victims and for victims to come forward, um, I think is enormously important. And But I also agree with what Andrew just said, that in the internet age, it's actually really quite challenging to enforce that anonymity because people would just go on to a social media site um and and there's no sort of kind of you know punishment for that being out there so i it, it I, I can see that it's i mean it's enormously complex we have to get people coming forward we have to get victims coming forward um and um i i, I as I say i thought i was sympathetic to the to the general sort of kind of context of what was being proposed um but now I'm not so sure. And, and, um, and there's also um, my mind has been a, a, changed. Another issue where people in the media generally know who, the, who these people are because yeah. it, word travels and, and fast. The and he, don't. Even when there's a super injunction, mm. we all know, and yet everyone out there does not. And there's something insidiously wrong about that. I think, Mary Crow. I think the principle of open justice is is the foundation of British law, and um, I don't think it should, you know, be interfered with in any way i think we know that we have around eighty-five thousand rapes each year less than two percent of them are ever reported to the police so it's already a crime that has how do we know then um, that there are because the figures the, the surveys that are done if you ask women about their experience of sexual violence and rape this is what comes out in surveys if you ask them um did you go to the police no i wouldn't be believed no my parents would kill me no i didn't think there was a conviction i didn't want to relive it all of the structural barriers that mean that women children and men who as victims will not report this because of the incredible shame around it um uh, uh, you just look at the convictions only 13 percent of that tiny number of cases actually ever end in a conviction we tried rape and um, anonymity for suspects accused of rape um between 76 and 88 and it was repealed because it was thought that rape was no worse a serious crime than murder and, and all the other horrible things um so actually it just this campaign perpetuates the myth that women are waking up in the morning um and thinking you know 
oh, what can I do today? I know, I'll go down to the police station, go through a really intrusive, intimate examination, which is what happens, and, you know cry for ages and pretend that I've been raped that is not how people work and that is I think it's really destructive and I think what it also does this campaign perpetuates this culture of impunity we know that the church that schools that the BBC in the case of Savile that the NHS in the case of Savile he had free reign in in hospitals in Yorkshire um you know that celebrities are protected that institutions even in Mm. parliament we're having our own uh, moment around that and you know, powerful people in in powerful institutions find ways to protect themselves. I think it's been very unfortunate the way that the, these historic allegations were reported by the tabloids. But that's an issue about the tabloids and the press rather than mm-hmm. and, and, and the kind of fact that the BBC tipped them off. That's an issue about that. And the police already have discretion. If the, if the um, accused has particular vulnerabilities, they can make that discretion. So I, I know of cases, historic child sex abuse cases, where one person's courage in speaking out, and I've, I've got constituents, men who have spoken out about their um, childhood experiences of rape, and who, where other people have come forward, and uh, as a result of that person being in the paper, and, and this is so important, because that's what helps build the picture, and we've seen it time and again in the Rotherham grooming scandal, mm-hmm. you know, once one person comes, lots, it gives other people the confidence to come forward. And it's interesting the way that you talk about Saville, because the the popular view is that, well, it was terrible then in the 70s. Of course it went on. And of course the police didn't believe them. And of course the justice system the was police different. Knew. But actually, it's. N- I'm afraid, I mean, as a feminist campaigner, I am optimistic. I have to be, or I wouldn't think that things could change. And I don't think that men, that boys, baby boys are born, programmed to rape or beat women. It's a, it's a social pressure and construction. But I do think that we, we're actually rolling backwards with rape. And there's no two ways about this. The police have been ordered now not to take a victim-centred approach and not to automatically believe the complainant. Now, what that tells those coming forward is it's going to be like the bad old days. Do you remember the Roger Grave documentary? where he filmed inside a police station somewhere in the suburbs where there were police officers that were just grilling this woman, telling her that she was no better than she ought to be and she must have brought it on herself. We're in a situation now where we have a CPS that have rolled back on the merit system where they were supposed to look at the case um, in front of them and decide whether or not it had merit. Now they're just looking at it as to whether or not they'll get a conviction and whether it's going to cost more money than they want to spend. We're having fewer convictions and fewer reports. The last thing that we need now is for those potential complainants to be put off by the fact that there will be more protection for those that have committed rape and I make no judgment about those men that are leading this campaign of course not rather than those that have actually suffered rape okay right let's move on to another question Adrian is in Bexhill Adrian what would you like to ask Um, thanks yeah what I'd like to ask is do we really think it's fair that yet again a Tory MP is put into the Prime Minister's job without ever having been voted there by the public. No, it's not. Oh, it's not like it's, on, this is the on, first I, time. I, I, I am chairing this. Oh, come on, Ian. <laughs> uh, Tracy Crouch. Well, you know, I, I, it's not like this is the first time it's happened. And, you know, it's happened throughout history and it happens. And you know, Twice in two system. years. But, well, I mean, I imagine we'll have an election before the end of the year anyway, but that's a different matter. So, um, but... Yeah, I mean, it's just the system that we have. Um, and, um, you know, I, I I don't personally have a problem with it. And I suspect that um, if the Labour Party do, then uh, they will call a vote of no confidence in the new Prime Minister, whoever that might be. Mary? Well, I mean, it's absurd. And the fact that... Why is it absurd? Because the, it's happened. Jim Callaghan was elected in the same way. Gordon Brown was elected in the same way. Why I is think it absurd? We're, a, we're facing a crisis in our country's history. We have got, had three years of the bre- Brexit logjam. And the idea that the new Prime Minister, who is meant to chart a path through this crisis, is going to be chosen by 160,000 p- members of the Conservative Party, which, by the way, has also been in infiltrated by Nigel Farage's Brexit party so you've seen your membership grow I think by about 40,000. Um, I wouldn't be so sure of that is, though because I mean <coughs> post, don't trust the numbers. Well, no, well the other thing I would say is that after we yet again failed to get the So you're not facing agreement, any problems in your local constituency no, party? Not at all. Okay. Um, when, and actually when we failed to get through the withdrawal agreement many of my members who were very strong Brexiteers were 
cancelling their membership, which, you know, was reminding them at the time that there would be mm. I mean, contest right, so right, it's, it's about this you, you, tiny you, percentage choosing I mean we didn't you, the, your party didn't even choose them it was a kind of coronation for Theresa May and that look how that ended um, well, and the idea that we're going hang to hang a second there is so much hypocrisy here yeah, what was Gordon, Gordon Brown, Brown apart from a coronation well, he didn't was, even have anybody opposing him that's true and I did nominate him and I, I don't <laughs> why I was nominating him at the time I was like look I just come back from maternity leave I was like oh do I need to nominate him isn't he going to get it anyway are you saying your hormones are all over the place <laughs> yeah <laughs> they always are Ian um, if you could turn off the air conditioning that would be great <laughs> It's because Ian's hormones are all over the place. Speak yeah. for yourself. I, I, I just, am having it's, a hot flash it's as a we moment speak. of the the contrast with Gordon Brown is Gordon got us through the biggest economic and no, financial no, no, no. crash you that happened you, afterwards. You can't just the pick and choose. You're either against it for everybody or not. You can't just pick and choose which just because it happens. I can to be, be against a it twice in a row. Election. I think once is fine. Two is starting to look like a pattern. <laughs> Three is is starting to look anti democratic. And I think that what's bothering me about this competition is that. Um, Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt are going round the country, and you were you were chairing one of their. You were, did brilliantly, so by the way. Them. You did brilliantly. They didn't like you. Sucking up to That's, me won't get you anywhere. No, no, yeah, well, but you did do well. well so he's respect. Not going to the, uh, um, the, the 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 accusation. But they're of out. Hypocrisy. They're out. They're out hard dealing each other. They're out hard Brexit, No Deal Brexit, and the idea that they're playing politics with all of our futures, with my kids' futures, in order to um, you know win the win the favour of. Uh, the you know eighty thousand Conservative Party members is frankly terrifying. Okay. Then, then they'll be punished. I don't know if Adrian um, agrees then, with they'll you. Be, then they'll be punished at the next general election, won't they? And the peril in this approach to politics and choosing a leader is that it forces you to narrow cast to one hundred sixty thousand people That's in the it. country and assume that they represent the broader view that you then have to go win in a general election. And woe to any party that focuses on on the militants and the hardcore membership at the expense of, oh my God, we actually have to win an election with more than these people. And you certainly can't win an election with 160,000 people. So if you want to change the system, change the system. Put that in your manifesto. Say, we will no longer allow this. And any time there's, there's a prime minister that leaves office, we will have a general election. Go ahead and put that in if you want to run on that. But if you don't, how, then just deal with the system as it is. How does this work in Canada? It's the same. So, so you, if if a prime minister were to, so Brian Mulroney is the only example I can think of. Left in 1992 when it was looking very grim uh, for him. Kim Campbell came in and, and was prime that, minister. That worked well, didn't it? Yeah, it went down to two <laughs> seats and annihilated the party and splintered it. So, so maybe there's but some foreshadowing there. Oh, yeah, yeah, enormously. Um, but also, I just think that you know, Labour um, colleagues who are getting incredibly vexed about this particular issue are just really still really we'll cross with that themselves that they cocked up their own leadership contest and ended up with Jeremy Corbyn as leader by accident so you know he was nominated to make up the numbers and then all of a sudden he's your leader Whoops. And, Mary's yeah. gone very quiet on this well, one well I stood um, against you, him in 2015 do, so don't don't do, forget do, that do, you know I've, I've got no reg- do, I've got though. no regrets I do yeah I remember that now Julie I think we've got a crisis of democracy right now. I would absolutely go for a second referendum. I would crown someone like Jess Phillips to be the new Prime Minister without even a general election or anything. And, I, and, and yet I am absolutely opposed on a general theoretical level to an anti-democratic act such as a, a, a second referendum. But I want it because I hate what's happening and I think that that's what part of this is about. Jess Phillips as Prime Minister, could we could we all sign up to that? It'd I love qu- Jess. It'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> Although people would keep be confusing fun. me and Jess. I, you know, people <laughs> keep coming up to me and saying... Actually, there's a bit oh. of a similarity, you're right. There, there are some also very obvious differences, which I won't say on air. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll buy you a drink after right. that. I, th- I think it's time we went to the news. It's 8.31. <laughs> Tim Humphrey has the news headlines. Police believe two railway workers who died when they were hit by a passenger train in South Wales this morning were wearing ear defenders and couldn't hear it coming. A colleague who was with them on the line near Port Talbot has been treated for shock. Detectives investigating the murder of a pregnant woman in South London say they're still trying to work out a motive. The 26-year-old baby, who was delivered by paramedics after the attack in Croydon on Saturday, has also now died. England are through to the semi-finals of the Cricket World Cup for the first time in 27 years after beating New Zealand by 119 runs at Durham, but the British number one Carl Edmund and Heather Watson both lost on day three of Wimbledon. LBC weather dry with clear spells for most of the UK tonight. It will be breezy in the north with some rain across northern Scotland at a low of 10 degrees. This is LBC. 
Sheila Fogarty, Monday to Friday from 1pm. I think the opposite, Colin. I think it will mobilise both well, sides think, uh, enormously. Well, I don't think... I'm will you to, vote? I don't know. It depends on how, how, you, how you... I can't how imagine they... why you wouldn't if you're this passionate well, about your position. Question, I know what's going to happen. There'll be three questions and I'll lower the voting age to 16. What if there are two questions and it's the same age of voting? Will you vote? I, I mean, I, I can't already, imagine... I've already, I already voted. Sheila Fogarty. With Blink Home Security Cameras, helping give your family peace of mind. LBC. So, what's everyone got for lunch, then? Just a sandwich. Yeah, I've got the same boring sandwiches yesterday. Oh, what have you got? Ah, a refreshingly smooth Costa iced latte, a tasty mozzarella and sun-dried tomato pasta salad, and a bag of fancy hand-cooked crisps. Why have the same thing every day? Pop into Costa Coffee for lunch and pick up your favourite hot or iced coffee with our delicious lunch deal, just £4.95. Costa's lunch deal available between 11 and 2. Visit costa.co.uk for full terms and participating stores. Lizzie, floral designer at Zing Flowers. One of my favourite bouquets is the Pink Sensation. It's got some of the nation's favourite stems in it, including rose and lily. It's a really nice size bouquet when it arrives. Beautiful florist-selected stems in stunning hand-tied bouquets. Zingflowers.com. Amazing every time. A cat-scratching DJ deck for Tigger. <laughs> You might not need a credit card to buy that, but for things you actually do need, think about the Think Money credit card. It'll keep you in control with text alerts. It comes with up to £1,500 credit limit and their quick online eligibility check doesn't affect your credit score. Check for yourself at thinkmoney.co.uk. Think Money credit card. There when you need it. Think Money Limited is a credit broker. Capital One, the exclusive lender. Representative 39.9% APR variable. Don't miss out on Vodafone's Double Data deal. That's double data on all pay monthly smartphones. Yes, all pay monthly smartphones. Now a huge 30 gig for the price of 15, starting at only £30 a month. Double the selfie sharing, double the playlist pumping and double the maps mapping. To get double data, go online or in-store today. Hurry, offer ends 9th of July. The future's exciting. Ready, Vodafone. Terms and details at vodafone.co.uk slash summer. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.34 here on LBC, listening to Cross Question with Julie Bindle, journalist, author and campaigner, Andrew McDougall, director at Trafalgar Strategy and former director of communications for the former, two formers here, Canadian... Pro- <laughs> <laughs> One day you'll be current. Uh, Canadian so Prime ex. Minister Stephen Harper, <laughs> Tracy Crouch, the Conservative MP also for Chatham and Aysfield and former <laughs> Minister for Sport, si- former. Civil Society and Loneliness, Mary oh. Cray uh, is... Current, current chair. Labour MP for Wakefield, but former... No, no. Current no, chair of the Environmental Audit Committee, That's Ian. very Excuse true. Me. Former leadership former contender. Leadership contender. <laughs> former shadow cabinet. But humiliated. In, well, he actually didn't even get Didn't to even the, get on the ballot. No. How I know. Is that? I was the Rory Stewart of the Labour Party. <laughs> I went around and talked to the voters and but, I had a great time, launched my campaign in the Daily right-wing. Mail. <laughs> What, me more right-wing yeah. than him? Yeah, no, I think no, so. No. <laughs> right, I think... You have no idea, Ian. <laughs> uh, well, let's go to another question, shall we? Jason is in Notting Hill. Uh, what's your question, Jason? My question is very simple. What right does the UK have to interfere in Hong Kong? Uh, if the UK actually cared about the honky, Hong Kong citizens, it wouldn't have created a second-class classification for these people after 1983 by classifying as British national overseas and not giving them the right to actually live in the UK and not giving them the right to actually be to work in the United Kingdom. They're a second class people according to the UK legislative process and you abandon them. What right do you have to interfere now? How have we interfered? Well, you're stipulating on their democratic views or who's right and who's wrong. The bottom line is you abandon them. You created a second-class uh, classification for them. Okay, no, you've made that point. Sorry? You've made that point. Um, Andrew McDougall. Yeah, well, I, I don't subscribe to the two wrongs make a right, then. You know, if they're being under threat now by, by let, a Chinese regime that are bad people, let's not be under any illusion here. Uh, I wouldn't want to live in China. I'd much rather live in Hong Kong. And if those rights are under threat and the government's threatening to ship uh, people from Hong Kong to China to face uh, justice, 
which we all know is injustice, then Britain should stand behind that. Every democracy should stand behind that and fight for it. And especially when you sign a handover agreement, uh, that, that there are treaties that exist to this day to protect those rights that were secured in 1997. Um, y you have to do that. So, so yeah, two wrongs don't make a right. If there's a right thing to do now, Britain should be doing it. And I salute the British government for standing up. I wish they would stand up a bit more on, on this and, and fight for, for the people of Hong Kong, who are demonstrating incredible bravery uh, millions strong in the streets uh, and did they overreach with storming the, the legislature into facing it? Maybe but that's the sign of the desperation there this is a serious issue against a nasty regime and I know what side of that debate I want to be on. I have to say I, I thought the British government's response has been rather limp-wristed um, over the past week or two that they haven't actually taken a very trenchant stance on this. What's your view Tracy Crouch? Well I wish that we were a bit Firmer, like Andrew was saying, sometimes about pointing out where countries are sort of kind of breaching human rights and, you know, standing up a bit more for what we believe in. But at the same time, I also have a level of slight unease about us um, dictating to other countries how they should be behaving and what they should be doing when we actually still, you know, behave badly ourselves in many respects. So um, I think that. You know, all of these issues are always incredibly complex and you have to take a balanced view and I'd be dreadful in the Foreign Office. I haven't got a sort of kind of diplomatic bone in me. But I just So you are ruling out yourself as Foreign Secretary <coughs> under the new leader of the Conservative Party? Most definitely. Um, Self-knowledge is a wonderful thing. I know, it's why I didn't stand for leadership. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> um, but I do think that, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I wish that we um, did actually stand up uh, and say things that we should be saying more often, more firmly, um, rather than just always thinking about some of the economic reasons why we need to be nice to countries. And, and so, I, you know, I, I, I have sort of kind of mixed views about the whole thing. OK, Julie Bindle. Well, China's a repressive regime. It undermines democracy, uh, undermines civil and political rights of all citizens, particularly minorities. Mm. Um, it wants to buy and control everything and wants to spread that way, that dictatorial uh, style uh, around the world. So it's clearly bleeding out from its own... Um, from its own disaster of government um, you know if we look at the kind of monitoring spying control of movement forced labor and it the fact that it views development um, as as uh, you know or, or, or just just money is more important than life then I think that we should be taking a stand and a stronger stand than we are and the idea that Western regimes have quashed protest in similar hard-handed ways is it would be a joke if it actually wasn't tragic so I would say more of it and I think that the more that people learn um, about China and its government and its regime and its its complete lack of concern and care about human dignity rights and life the better just ask the Uyghur Muslims who are under exactly. kind of digital surveillance totally well, there's a million home. people yeah. rounded up into look what looks like modern-day concentration camps mm -hmm. there's been long a long history of oppression in Tibet um, and the fact is that we've got the most authoritarian Chinese leader ever um, mm -hmm. What I think, I mean, there's terrible human rights abuses. China executes more people than any other country in the world. And there are terrible stories of organ harvesting that come out um, as well, um, particularly from the Falun Gong, mm -hmm. uh, people who pa practice Falun Gong. So I, I, I think that we have been, I agree with you, Ian, I think we've been timid on this. I think we have a historic duty I to I said Hong you were Kong. right wing. <laughs> I think we have a historic duty. Well, human rights and respect for human rights are, are kind of universal values, aren't they? And I suppose we've got a historic obligation to, to, to people in Hong Kong because mm -hmm. we, we, tr we made that transfer. We've got the treaty and China has got to respect that treaty. What we have now is an authoritarian ruler. There are some rumours, you know, is it agent provocateur? You know, was it deliberately? I don't know. But the fact is the British government's response has been muted because we're, we're up against the, the end, second biggest economy. In the world and, what and the post Brexit do? Britain trade says we've got to, you know, slavishly it drives me mad. Kowtow yeah, it to, drives to, me mad to all these different that. regimes. It's but rubbish. But we can't do anything militarily. We're enthralled to the Chinese because we want their money to yep. invest in this country. So why don't we just hold our hands up and say, well, there's nothing we can We're do, a bit so rubbish. just carry on, do what you like. I think, I mean, the, and the, the point is that, you know, the Chinese have had quite a, di a quite a big response to what we've said, even though it's not been that exciting. And, and we have summoned the ambassador to the Foreign Office today so it's kind of like 
oh, you mm-hmm. know, even the little thing that we said has, has had a disproportionate mm, but, but that's, reaction. That's their MO these days. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there are two Canadians that are that were abducted. Yes. Um, because, still there. because Canada acted on an extradition treaty at the request of the United States to detain the Huawei a financial yeah. officer in Canada has now had canola ban, pork ban. They are playing hardball. And yet we had a little ice cream party uh, for Canada Day in Beijing, invited everyone around. You know, it's just unserious uh, the way the Western world deals with China. And, and there might be only one issue I'm on board with Donald Trump on, and that's that China are, are I think, depending on what day he wakes up on China. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, know, Donald Trump seems to get on rather well with President Xi. But, but he has, you know, if there's bipartisan consensus in Washington on one thing. It is that China are bad people. And we need to have a look at bad, how they and, people. And, and, and people yeah. in Hong Kong are right not to want to face extradition to China where the death penalty is used mm-hmm. in, in the oh. most egregious way. And just ask the booksellers that were disappeared out of Hong Kong yeah. over Ai the past Weiwei. Yeah. Ai Weiwei, under house arrest. Mm-hmm. Right, um, we'll move on in a moment. 0345 6060 973. Um, someone has texted to say, if Mary Cray thinks a new PM chosen by Tory party members um, is bad, what about denying 17.4 million Brexit voters? Um, interesting point. Uh, Ford says, I think what China is doing to Hong Kong is wrong, but Britain still thinks it's the big boy, but it's not, and we need to keep our noses out of other countries' business. Uh, Graham says, democracy must prevail in Hong Kong, and I'd like to think that all our politicians who agree with that would honour the result of the Brexit referendum. There's a theme developing <laughs> there. Uh, we'll come on to another question in just a moment. It's 8.43. Monday to Friday from 4pm. How many one-to-one interviews will your candidate do during this election? I can't answer that. I mean, I think that... Well, let me ask you another question. Will he resign if he fails to deliver Brexit by October the 31st? Well, I think Boris has been absolutely clear. No, he hasn't. Eddie Mayer. Monday to Friday from 4pm. LBC. Get an Ocean credit card. Check if you're eligible in minutes without affecting your credit score. It comes with a credit limit of up to £1,500 too. So get online and check for yourself at ocean.co.uk and get all that from Ocean. Intelligent London Limited is a credit broker. Capital One, the exclusive lender. Representative 39.9% APR variable. This summer, Uber is sponsoring the 2019 ICC Cricket World Cup. To celebrate and say thank you, We're giving partner drivers across the UK the chance to win tickets to a match and a range of exclusive cricket goodies. To win, all you have to do is test your knowledge with a super simple cricket quiz. So if you drive with Uber, open your app now to enter and you could be enjoying a match in the sun soon. T's and C's apply. Some not guaranteed. Don't miss out on Vodafone's double data deal. That's double data on all pay monthly smartphones. Yes, all pay monthly smartphones. Now a huge 30 gig for the price of 15, starting at only £30 a month. Double the selfie sharing, double the playlist pumping and double the maps mapping. To get double data, go online or in-store today. Hurry, offer ends 9th of July. The future's exciting. Ready, Vodafone. Terms and details at vodafone.co.uk slash summer. At Lidl, we're big on the tennis. Big on 400 grams of British strawberries at £1.69. And a 95p, big on never having too much cream. Big on popping the Prosecco for just £5.99. That's game, set and match. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes NI. You can complain free to your lender or the financial ombudsman about missold PPI. Alternatively, if you haven't got the time or the inclination, then just get the claims guys to manage the claims process for you. With the August 29th deadline approaching, times at a premium anyway so if you can't find your paperwork or you're not even sure you have ppi it's definitely time to make a decision and start your ppi claim before it's too late text answer to double six treble seven text answer to double six treble seven now the claims guys becky you've been out there for a while come on top up your sun cream but i'm powering up what do you mean? You can get electricity from the sun, right? So I thought I'd try it too. I don't think it quite works like that, love. But either way, you need more cream on. Fine. At Shell Energy, we supply all our home energy customers with 100% renewable electricity as standard. Just their homes, mind you. Search Shell Energy. Home energy matters. Visit shellenergy.co.uk. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 
8.46, you can watch us on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, the Facebook page or the Twitter feed, and do keep your calls coming, 0345 6060 973. We're going to be talking about foreign language teaching Ooh, yes. after nine. Um, oh. No, we're not now, I'm afraid. No, I could have done you some Italian Sa- or yeah. French. If you, want, if you want to stay on, you can take part in that discussion I'll too. T- I'll quote you some Dante. Now, do you... <laughs> Julie Bindle is here, Andrew McDougall, Tracy Crouch and Mary Cray. Uh, Let's go to our next questioner, who's Alex in Ashford. Hello, Alex. Hello there. Uh, My name is Alex McGovern. I'm 16 and uh, I'm a member of Youth Parliament. And one thing that I'm very concerned about is the rise in knife crime. I mean, we've seen a 77% increase in homicides with knives by under 18 from 2006 to 2018. I'm sure all the panellists tonight will know that um, the recent media reports of the double homicide of the mother and her uh, baby son uh, has shown that there's such a large problem with knife crime. And before I ask the question, I'd like to chip in this debate because I think that the youth voice is often so ignored yep, and you're right. on removed politicians in Westminster. So what I want to ask is, how do the panellists believe that we could call knife crime? Oh. Right, and I will come back to you after they've had their say, Alex, and you can tell me what you think of it. Um, Mary Cray, this is not just a London issue, is it? No, it's not. And the instances of arrests and confiscation of knives has gone up dramatically in Wakefield as well. It's happening right the way across the country. And, um, you know, I found it really shocking. Um, I've got a 16-year-old son, and congratulations, Alex, on being elected to your youth parliament. I found my youth parliamentarians in Wakefield really uh, brilliant um, advocates uh, for for their peers. And, you know visionaries with a kind of view of, of how they want the world to be so so thank you for what you're doing I think there's a couple of things here first of all we've had several debates on this in the House of Commons and for some of my colleagues like uh, Vicky Foxcroft and um Sarah Jones down in Croydon there is a a lot of talk and a lot of interest in tackling knife crime as a public health issue because if you look at it and you map it you can see the the places where um, victims and uh, assailants live, you can um, see the behaviours that lead up to an arrest or a conviction or an incident. And so, actually, what you've got to do is kind of put protective, um, and, and you know, you've got to get in there early and, and snap it out. It's a bit like a measles epidemic. You don't sort of wait till it's all across the country. You go in, you 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 do your vaccination, and you create a cordon sanitaire, and you you kind of shut it down. And that's what we've not done. And there's reasons why we haven't done that and that's because the government has cut funding to the police we've got 20,000 fewer police officers so all of that community-based policing and intelligence has now gone there's also the fact that the kind of services that have been put around families have been sort of systematically stripped away children's services are in crisis children's mental health services are also in crisis and so we've got this issue about you know that the sort of enabling state that that kind of that wraps around you to, to sort these problems out and wraps around families that are struggling and children that are struggling is no longer there and so it's ending up in this you know where it's normalized that you carry a knife because if you don't and someone attacks you then you're in trouble and you'll be the victim and i think looking at those public health approaches and using big data to do much much smarter analysis of of who is likely who is most at risk um to be at this we know okay. for the children that have been murdered that they are likely to be school uh, pupil referral units to have refused school etc so there's a whole pattern of behavior that leads up to this that we need to nip in the bud julie bendel i agree with every word that you say um i'd like to add though that i think the way we collect we collate um crime statistics with knife with particular homicides uh, um such as the ones we're talking about it's sometimes misleading it's not all gang on gang young man on young man yeah, no. um there are there are two women who die every week in fact there are there's there's one every three days um in england and wales a woman who dies often um by knife uh, knife crime um who is in fact the victim of the for a former uh, or a current partner so we're talking about domestic violence related femicide which we have to collate outside of gang related homicide but I, I also think that you know we we need to look at how we engage with young people in gangs including young women who are caught up in gangs mm. and who are terrorized and who have nowhere to go mm. when they want to report these crimes and they're often used as knife mules mm-hmm. and we seem to forget about the young women drug who mules in and this. also suffer incredibly okay. bad sexual violence uh, Crouch. um well alex 
First of all, I share Mary's view about your election to Youth Parliament. I work very closely with both Medway and Kent uh, Youth Parliaments and really enjoy hearing actually what youngsters have to say and, and what they think that we should be focusing on in Westminster. Um, I also work very closely with Kent Police uh, on a lot of issues and um, have, have actually had quite detailed insight into work that they are doing on gang and knife crime. One of the challenges they face, and maybe this is something that the Youth Parliament can help them with, is actually getting into schools um, and talking about uh, the perils of carrying a knife or being involved in a gang because actually the schools themselves don't like the police coming in in case it gives the impression that they are suffering from a gang or a knife related um, problem and actually it's not it's about you know the police going in there and trying to um, educate people about um, the dangers but also the parents and how to spot if they're Ch their child has become involved in a gang um, and so I think that's perhaps something that the Youth Parliament can help the police with Kent Police has had a record recruitment um, from the, the Police and Crime Commissioner Matthew Scott and so we have more new police officers um, than I think in el elsewhere in the country, uh, including my very own nephew who is based in Ashford. So um, I, I think that you know it is not just a London issue, as others have said. It is a complex issue, as Mary and Julie have pointed out. Um, but I think if there's things that you can do to help the police, I think they would be grateful. Andrew? Well, first, I'm going to disagree. I think youth parliament people are a bit weird. I didn't come into politics when I was 30, and it always freaked me out when people that young had any clue about what they wanted or thought jealous. about the world. Well, no, because <laughs> they're dangerous. Alex, you've, they're got, dangerous you've got about two minutes to work out your response to Andrew, and yeah. it can be as full throttle as you like. <laughs> but yeah, no, strange people. Um, but on, on knife crime, seriously, it, there's a short term and a long term thing. Short term, you actually have to get more police on the streets, I think, and 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 push down because yeah. the people, when you're stabbing people in in broad daylight, yeah, uh, you're not afraid that you're going to get caught Ooh. and there's going to be a response. You have to do that. And then on the public health approach, yeah, because we have family issues, school issues, um, we have an internet now that bids up violence, uh, particularly here in Filming London. You s you see that that it, it's actually taunting online that gets bidded up into street violence. And, and there's a whole element here of the speed of, of almost like a radicalization of, mm. of youth that it comes to violence and honor so quickly. And so you have to cut all of that out. And, and what leaders have to try to figure out a way to do is take the heat uh, off the streets and out of the debate. And it's not just, do you have more table tennis to play? Is there a safe place to come? It's so much deeper than that. And, and that's going to take a generation, maybe, or a long time to fix. But in the short term, get more police on the streets and put some pressure on these people so they fear that they might get caught. I I don't, we can't wait for a generation. And also, we've got to get people into hospitals so that when people are admitted with knife wounds, we have the people there to put the structures in around them so that they can, you know, move that, away from that. That's a teachable moment when yeah, you're yeah. on a gurney. And that's okay. where we can work for, learn from London, actually, because London's got some really yeah. great... But even Glasgow did take some time. Yeah. And London's a much bigger... And many cities are much bigger and more complex. Right, let's go back to Alex. Uh, what do you make of what you've heard, Alex? Uh, I'm quite pleased with what I heard about the public health approach. I am slightly concerned that many of the uh, politicians, not only on the panel tonight, but in general, are saying more what they think the public want to hear than what they actually will do. Because I find that one of the big causes of knife crime is a lack of opportunity in disenfranchised communities. And I would just like to come back to Tracy by the end of what I'm about to say, to ask her if she would agree that austerity and her government's own austerity measures have actually led to the many deaths that are occurring. And I'll, I'll get to why in a minute. If we look at the Scotland uh, Violence Reduction Unit, they halved Glasgow's murder rate, which was once the murder capital of the EU. And how did they do that? Well, they took a holistic approach where they didn't just focus on policing, they focused on many government departments. And I think one of the most important things we must focus on is education. Because one thing with uh, people who carry knives, whether they're in a gang or not, is that they have no aspiration for a better future. They see nothing except what's in front of them and they don't think about the consequences of their actions because they have no value on their life. So what's so important is more funding for education. So we're not just learning about Pythagoras theorem and protein synthesis and quadratic inequalities. We're learning about things that we need to know, different careers, softer skills like CV writing, because that is what will get people into jobs and away from a life of crime. And that's not just from prevention. We also need to rehabilitate um, young people who have fallen into a life of crime. Okay, I mean, three listen, CB listen Alex, we've only got four minutes left and I want to squeeze another question in. I'm, I want, I want okay. you to go come back to Andrew though, because you think someone of your age being involved in politics is weird. 
Well, I think it's what's more weird is that... Uh, and I worked for Prime making, Minister for seven years, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I think what is more weird is old people making decisions for younger people that they don't really know that much about. I think that... that I <laughs> you think got that, told, Andrew. You uh, got told and you got kid. owned. He thinks I'm old. That's very yeah, sweet. Yeah, I mean... Go for it, than, Alex. Uh, many of the people getting stabbed. I think we need more um, funding for young people services because that's what will stem crime. Yeah. We need to give people okay. aspirations. All right, well, let, totally. uh, 100% just, let, with let, Alex. Just, well done, let, Alex. Let, let Tracy Crouch answer your question on austerity and then we'll move on. Well, I don't disagree with the holistic point that you made, Alex, at all. I mean, austerity was uh, something that had to happen in terms of how we responded to no. the economic crisis. It, it was a political it choice. There was a question as to... And the I've, country I've, had I've, so much money in 2010. Yeah. So much. I mean, I, I, I have publicly said whether or not, you know, it, it could have finished or certainly tailed off um, sooner than it has. Um, but, um, you know, I, I agree with your point about working across uh, department. My mother um, has worked in Kent Social Services with children and families her entire life. And, you know, you don't deal with these issues um, as a single agency. Um, and, you know, you have to work across all multiple partners and agencies. Um, so I, I don't disagree with part okay. of the point. Um, Cindy has texted to say, I miss this youngster's name, it's Alex, but can't wait for him to become an MP. Alex Me too. Me Andrew too. McDougal. <laughs> right, Alex, thank you very Work much. Behind great, the scenes, great call. It's more fun. Um, quick text from Tony and Slough. Will the success of England women's football encourage more women to take part in sport? 30 seconds each. Tracy Crouch, yes, former sports minister. Absolutely hope so. And footballer yourself. Indeed. And manager, former manager, former former footballer, former manager. Yes, I think it will. And not just in football, I think. And also, actually, not just girls. Um, I think it will also inspire older women. We're seeing a, 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 a real growth in um, veterans uh, football. Has, and by the way, veteran is anyone over the age of 25. Um, and me, um, so uh, <laughs> we, we're seeing a, a massive growth in women's sport. And we've got a whole summer of it. And Ian, you're going to be a sort of West Ham ladies season you know, ticket holder from I, now on. I watched the, did you watch the series about West Ham ladies um, on BBC no. Three? You'll love it. Watch it. It's all about sort of how David Sullivan's son took hold of it and has run it. And it's fa absolutely fascinating. Um, Mary Cray, we've got the um, England w women's cricket on television at the moment. The England women's netball team team and the football this would not have happened 10 years ago what's changed i think i think excellent <laughs> sports ministers like tracy um but look um, women's football was was a big thing sort of 50 80 years ago and and we got banned i mean talk about structural inequality uh -huh. we were banned from playing it's incredible to think of that and when people say, when young women say i'm not a feminist it's like you know you, you want girls to do the same thing as boys. oh yeah oh yeah well that's uh -huh. feminism so um i loved netball i loved football i was out and playing it in my back garden and the entry every night and so it has kind of made me think oh i think i've got the ball skills to to go back in the game um we're watching it last night team. it's too early <laughs> um 8 8 a.m is too much it's too early tracy for me um I, is that what you do you play football yeah, at eight o'clock they train in the at chelsea they no, train at chelsea. Well chelsea train us oh chelsea train okay they, they don't do. go down to the ground okay well that's that's not that that's not that far maybe i will but my my point is watching that match last night watching the offside goal watching the penalty getting missed watching Watching those uh, Americans being really, you know, putting them past it. It was just, it was just so gripping. And also, I noticed there was a lot more, a lot less falling to the ground than you get in the men's game. Oh. I said to my husband, "There's a lot less acting it here." And then the Americans started and I bet, towards and the I end. bet he told you the truth, Julie. <laughs> it's great. And it's nice to see an out lesbian on the football pitch. Because let's face it, we're not going to get it from the male. Well, obviously they're not lesbians. But <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to get it from the, uh, from the less brave uh, Premier, we left something in the dressing Premier room. League uh, male players, are we? Um, they're better role models than Love Island. That's all I'm going to say Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. Andrew. My three and a half year old daughter already loves football. Already knows to cheer for Chelsea. So job done, Dad. Oh, <laughs> Right, our final, Frank, light, Kirby, ho final light hearted <laughs> question. We really do have to be very quick on this. Who or what would you like to be reincarnated as? I asked this to the two Tory leadership con uh, contenders. We asked it in Carlisle. Jeremy Hunt said a Cumbrian farmer, which I thought was a little bit of a lame answer. And Boris <laughs> Johnson said Pericles or Aristotle. Um, Tracy. Well, I really like me, so I'm going to say me, but with bigger boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you racy thing, you. Uh, or a professional footballer. <laughs> Julie, Julie. Anna Madrigal in Tales of the City. It's on Netflix at the moment. Ooh. It's brilliant. Mary. 
my daughter's hamster it has a great life it sleeps all day it has a little chew on its thing <laughs> it's the only thing that's awake when i go home at night it's the only thing that talks to me having said that i would like to go back about 200 years and see what britain was like before industrial farming and look at all the birds and all the different things so i'd like to go back to like shakespearean it's a totally or, different question i know but that's I, you know tess of the I mean, she's, answering, so she's answering her own questions could, now could, andrew I want to be Tom York from Radiohead because oh, who yeah. doesn't want to be a rock star? Could you imagine if I if we were at Hustings Inn and I actually answered the answer? You'd be Prime Minister just given. Well, that Do it. Uh, that question was actually asked, and the reason I thought of it was at a um, parliamentary selection that I attended, and I'll t- I can't say it on the radio <laughs> what the answer was, but I will tell you in just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you are listening to LBC. Thanks to Julie Bindle, Andrew McDougall, Tracy Crouch, and Mary Cray. Uh, we'll be back with Cross Question next Wednesday at eight, and you can catch up on the podcast as well in a moment we're going to be talking about foreign languages you're listening to lbc it's one minute past nine on your radio on global player and play lbc leading britain's conversation this is lbc From Global's newsroom, a man who was stabbed in Battersea in South London this afternoon has died. Police were called to Latchmere Road at quarter to three. The victim died in hospital this evening. Police are investigating the deaths of two railway workers hit by a train on tracks near Port Talbot in South Wales this morning.